Uh, good afternoon. I'm Diego Chavez Gonzalez. I'm the Senior Manager for Latin America and the Caribbean Initiative at the Migration Policy Institute. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to today's afternoon panel discussion titled United States and the World Increasing Migration Within the Western Hemisphere. Before I introduce today's panelists, let me begin by highlighting that the Western Hemisphere is currently undergoing a profound transformation in terms of human mobility. Some experts even argue that we are entering a new era of human mobility characterized by dynamic nature across the region. Nowhere else on the planet has uh, seen a more significant relative increase in international migration in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Looking a little bit about numbers, uh, we have between 16 and 18 million people uh, that are migrants right now from different ranges of, of, of migration. We have Venezuelan migrants, 6 million Venezuelan migrants approximately in the region, or a little bit over 6 million Venezuelan migrants in the region. We have uh, over a million as well of Haitian migrants, uh, Nicaraguan migrants, half a million, Colombian migrants, especially the last couple of years have migrated almost half a million as well. Uh, and so uh, some Ecuadorian migration that is happening right now currently uh, and if we look at the number 16 to 18 million people, this is roughly the same population of an entire country like Ecuador or like Guatemala. On top of that type of, my, uh, of, of this huge numbers of migration, we have different types of migration. We have transit migration happening at the hemisphere. We have circular migration as well. And we of course have a lot of migrants who have the intention of settling in some of these, of these countries. Um, allow me to introduce our STEAM panelists today who are at the forefront uh, for supporting governments across the region. We have Ansan Hoover, uh, the Chief of Mission at IOM in DC, who has previously worked in many different places, uh, just to name a few, Geneva, Zimbabwe, South Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq. And joining him is uh, John Hoysider, uh, the Deputy Representative of UNHCR. Uh, who has worked extensively in Central Europe and closely collaborated with the Syrian res emergency response. Both agencies, UNHCR and IOM, play pivotal roles, not only in the Americas, but also in other parts of the world, working with governments building capacity and development systems managing migration and protection. And indeed, for me, it's an honor to, to have Anzan and, and Jean to share the space with both of you, so welcome. Um, and let me start by maybe asking to, to both of you uh, the, first, the first question. Before delving into the US or the United States role, could you provide an insight into other countries in the hemisphere have responded uh, to the surge in migration and displacement? Many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, which historically received relatively few migrants or refugees, have had to swiftly establish protection systems and migration institutions while adapting their policies in recent years. How have they managed uh, this so far? Gonzalo, let's start with you, or you no, want no, to start, no. Don? Uh, We're very used to tag teaming in these discussions, so I'm sure Jan will complement whatever uh, I may have missed out or mischaracterized. Thanks for this opportunity uh, to be here and to, to see so many of you here in person. We we're just reflecting on the fact that uh, we're almost not used to seeing real people anymore. We're so used to speaking on Teams and, and through screens. It's a little intimidating to see so many of you here, but it's great to see such keen interest um, on the topic of migration and refugees in this particular hemisphere. Um, perhaps, I mean, Diego, you've done this, you've, you've put things in context, but I think it's, it's, it, it bears reiterating uh, just how prevalent migration and human mobility have always been within the Western Hemisphere uh, in a way, and that impacts the way in which I think many governments across the Western Hemisphere have addressed the more recent displacement crises of the past 12 years, 13 years or so. I mean, usually when we speak of this, we backdate it to, um, uh, to the Haiti earthquake in 2010. Um, and of course, all of this was upended by the, uh, the Venezuela situation, uh, which we've been grappling with for a number of years now. But Governments have long been used uh, in this hemisphere uh, to fashioning um, migration systems to facilitate human mobility, uh, not necessarily in response to crises or sudden uh, population movements or forced displacement uh, for that matter, but as a way uh, to work towards better integration uh, amongst countries, of course, amongst which there is natural proximity cultural proximity, um, which is long established. And so, you know, as we all know, within South America, within Central America, within the Caribbean, 
uh, long-standing uh, frameworks uh, exist uh, to facilitate at least temporary uh, migration. Uh, and those have largely been made use of uh, by countries in the Western Hemisphere to try and adapt and adjust and respond uh, to the displacement crises uh, of the last few years. And so my point, I guess, would be given the nature of this conference is that you know migration within the Western Hemisphere, whether displacement, forced migration, or voluntary migration is by no means one dimensional in terms of directions. Not all movements are headed towards North America, towards the United mm -hmm. States Southwest border. Um, we see this as recently as, uh, as, uh, as last month, we've put out another uh, displacement and migration outlook for the first half of 2023, which clearly indicates that there continu continues to be significant population directions towards South America, uh, Chile, Brazil, uh, remain destination countries, uh, and largely within, within America. Um, and that applies as well to the Venezuela crisis, of course. Um, most of the, the brunt of the, of, the, of the burden, so to speak, of the Venezuela crisis has been and continues to be absorbed by neighboring countries to Venezuela, whether it be Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, um, who have taken their share, resorting to, I think, and Jan will speak to this, protection mechanisms, of course, um, to account for the, uh, the nature of, uh, of forced displacement, but also using and adapting regular migration tools um, mm -hmm. to adopt largely regularization uh, processes, temporary protection uh, mechanisms uh, in support of Venezuelans, humanitarian schemes uh, for Haitians on the move, in particular in Brazil or in Chile. Uh, so the full toolbox, if you will, uh, has been adapted, including in customizing regular migration tools, which were enabled by free movement agreements within the region. Um, and we see this playing out. So I think it's important that we understand the more recent surge in forced migration, um, the awful situations we see play out across the Darien Gap, as well through the uh, historical lens, let's say, and, uh, and uh, of, of one of meaningful, useful integration within the region. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. And uh, you know, thanks also for myself to invite us to this event uh, on the 20th annual anniversary, no less. Um, as, as uh, along the same lines as Vincent's um, comments, uh, I would also thank you actually for setting the scene for this discussion in a regional context. I think it's a very important starting point. I did listen to some of the earlier discussions this afternoon, um, going into a number of, of the challenges uh, that, that the US is faced with and that many of us are, are involved with. But I think it is really important to recognize upfront that um, the, the refugee migration challenge is a regional one, is a global one. It is not a US uh, discussion, it's not a Europe discussion. It's something that needs to be solved at the global level. In fact, you've given us the numbers, you took some of the things that I, I was gonna try and say, and, and thank you for doing that in terms of the most of people uh, staying in their regions of origin, staying even in their countries of origin after displacement. And uh, obviously many of those countries are in the so-called developing world. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important starting point as we look at what are the, what's the way forward, how can we collaborate going forward. You mentioned the Americas and what have other countries had to deal with. Vincent laid it out, um, maybe from the UNICEF perspective, just to, just to point towards a couple of looking backwards, a couple of key developments uh, in the Americas that are still with us today and that we can build on. Uh, and I'm sure in this room, there are many, uh, much uh, more, more uh, many, many of you who have more, much more expertise on the history of this region. But certainly I think uh, it's important to acknowledge the, the, what happened after the 70s and the 80s in the Americas with the emergence of crisis in Central America, in South America, and Based on that, the emergence of a regional framing of refugee protection through the Cartagena Declaration and the many following um, efforts that continue today to define who is a refugee in this continent and uh, what are the ways to respond to them. Uh, I'm mentioning this because it has had regional significance, but it has also had global significance. It's, it's something that has been um, notice around the world as, as a valuable regional engagement by states to make sure that there is cooperation on the standards of providing protection and how that collaboration can happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
picking then up on the more recent history, as you said in your introduction, we are now in a situation where the dynamics of displacement have changed since that time when the Cartagena Declaration was, uh, was born. And um, yes, it has uh, manifested itself, not least through the Venezuela situation, Americas is now, um, you know, every every twenty, every every fifth person in the world displaced is is in the Americas, but it is mixed. Um, it is not just a refugee situation. It is people moving along the same routes for different reasons, uh, with different uh, uh, needs, with different destinations, um, and yes, countries throughout the Americas have struggled with being overwhelmed. There are systems that have been developed since the 80s have been overwhelmed. The legislation has not been fit for purpose. The mechanisms to respond to, to individuals on the need have not been able to, to, address, um, to address those. So um, I think though that um, it's also worth uh, recognizing achievements that have been made also in this context. And um, looking, for instance, at the way that countries like Colombia, you would know it well, Diego, have responded to um, receiving the, 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 the lion's share of people having left Venezuela by um, welcoming um, populations through the regularization, migration status, temporary status. These are mega trends as well globally that we we need to reflect upon what is the place of the asylum regime in a world where states are increasingly turning to alternative statuses, temporary statuses. It's something from UNHCR that we have welcomed, but we're also keenly aware that we need to preserve asylum in that reality. And I think it's it's one of the points we, we perhaps can come back to. Maybe I'll end on this point. Um, even with those uh, that progress made, there is a, a, a lot to be done. Um, reading up a bit this weekend on 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 effort so far, it's a bit depressing to see that we organized with IOM and OAS in 2009 a regional meeting, which could have been a description of today's discussion. Even the recommendations could have been a, an outcome that could have been from last month. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, it it tells me we we we've, we've been aware of this issue for a while. We've been struggling with it for a while. We clearly haven't made enough progress. Um, so so uh, I hope we'll touch on a few points in this discussion of what might that progress look like. Thank you both. And um, we're also witnessing a significant increase in the number of people seeking refuge in the United States. The US government has emphasized the importance of expanding legal pathways and adjusting protection mechanisms to effectively manage these flows. Could you elaborate on why this approach matters? Uh, yeah, thank you. We um, complement each other, so you feel free to either use just, that or... <laughs> yeah. just, a, just a few uh, thoughts on this. Um, uh, the volumes uh, have increased, but I think, well, and, and that's the reason that, you know, I was joking that, you know, we're used to sitting together in these uh, discussions, uh, and I suspect that's why you invited us both as well, is, uh, you know, the the complexity of human mobility flows uh, has considerably increased as well. And, and I think we see this play out in every part of the world, uh, but certainly uh, in the Americas uh, as well over the past, you know, 10, 12 years. Um, it is increasingly difficult um, to establish neat distinctions between those who may find themselves to be in need of, um, forgive me, Jan, but in need of it, traditional international protection, if you will, um, and those who move, uh, you know, out of other considerations, uh, economic considerations, of course, but it will also display at times very significant vulnerabilities, um, which might not amount to, you know, a need to be recognized as a refugee or a person of concern to UNHCR, but nonetheless do require some form of protection. And therefore, I think it is important that, um, you know, governments, including the United States, um, along the lines of the arguments that you that you presented, Diego, um, come up with innovative, um, you know, dynamic uh, tools and instruments to try and address the complexity uh, of this and the dynamism of these population flows. 
um, because you know we see as well these uh, the dynamics of population movements change very fast. Um, the nature of migration changes very fast. The makeup of nationalities changes very fast. The social economic profile mm -hmm. of migrants is very reactive, um, and you know governments, if not. Uh, in the situation of introducing uh, some of these uh, mechanisms, additional lawful pathways, short-term measures, temporary protection, whatever it may be, um, what's the alternative? The alternative is smugglers and traffickers. Um, and that is part of the rationale uh, for our engagements with the United States uh, and many other governments in the Western Hemisphere, is that the alternative people will find a way um, to migrate, um, putting themselves in the process in harm's way, um, as we see, again, uh, you don't have to look very far to see, to witness many examples of, uh, of uh, horrible uh, circumstances migrants face as they seek to travel from South to North America uh, irregularly with the help of, uh, of those who abuse and exploit them. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, any steps that governments uh, may make and initiate whilst respecting, of course, and abiding by their international obligations, which are important, uh, and their commitments um, to extend protection uh, when it needs to be extended, um, come up with solutions. I think that these are efforts that are always welcome as an effort not necessarily to regain, let's say, control over these movements, uh, because we need to be realistic as well, um, but at least to try and offer alternatives, better information, safer and more regular pathways um, for, for individuals to continue to migrate. Um, so I think it is essential uh, to, to have that conversation. Whether the models that are being uh, put forward are perfect, um, you know, we all operate uh, within you know, the parameters of a realistic regulatory framework uh, which are always quite constraining uh, in any government uh, in this uh, hemisphere and elsewhere in the world. But having that conversation, engaging multilaterally as well with, with all concerned governments, origin countries, transit countries, destination countries, is essential, I think, uh, to coming up with new ways um, to approach these challenges. <laughs> so you're bringing the discussion, uh, if I understand you, closer to the to the U.S. perspective, and and again building on Vincent's points. I think it's it's important to recognize again from our side, the U.N. of course, that, uh, that the U.S. also has a very proud history of providing refugee refuge um, or, or providing safe haven, and and has a lot to be proud of, has a lot to build on, and and I. I put it down to make sure I don't misquote it, the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Um, I think there's there's been a lot of meaning in that. There's been a lot of, of, of uh, manifestation of that through 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 U the US history. And, and it's of course something to build on as we look at what is the way that the US can deal with this very significant challenge of the, of the mixed movements that we're talking about here. And I think before maybe delving into the pathway issue from, from, from our side, when it comes to the refugee specific part of it, um, we of course want to recognize the two ways that the US has focused its contribution um, in that sense, or at least uh, the, 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 on, on the domestic side, the two ways that the US has, has focused its, its support. And that is of course through the refugee resettlement the, the the organized identification and 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 um, and transfer of of individuals to the United States where they will have uh, be received and given a status that is long term and predictable. The U.S. Uh, has been the, the 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 biggest global player in this, has driven development on this, and is still rebuilding and strengthening its its uh, re refugee resettlement um, uh, capacity. And, and, and UNHCR, of course, and IOM is, is very much involved with that. The other side of it, which especially if you read the media, is sometimes less given less attention to and less and, and is often more confused in the way it's presented, is of course, what about people who arrive at the US border? also refugees, also in need of protection. What is their status? What is the US response to people who haven't been identified um, further afield, but who have made their own way to the US? And on that, I think uh, it's very clear that the US has had, um, again, played a big role in providing um, entry to, to its country and, 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 and letting people access asylum procedures through the years. But 
it's equally clear that those asylum procedures developed primarily through the 80s and the 90s, and with all the, the, the challenges that the US is facing in its reform effort, that system is no longer, if I dare say, fit for purpose at the border in terms of what, how it can respond to uh, the mixed flows that we're seeing. And, and that issue has many elements to it that we could have a whole conference separately just on that. Mm -hmm. But just to say that um, um, we're working uh, with the US to see how can one, when, when, when there are people with different needs, different requirements, different backstories, different intentions coming through the same routes, how does the system respond to that? How is the capacity there? To, 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 to manage those claims? And how can the US um, manage that part in parallel with its, with its resettlement, bringing people to, to, to this country? And here comes uh, the other element. And how can the US also reach out to people before they reach that border? Mm -hmm. How can the US uh, be part of a collaborative effort to engage with people on the move before they have had to depend on the services of smugglers, traffickers? How can we as the UN and the international community work with countries to make sure that that collaboration is there and that refugee response is not an issue border by border? Mm -hmm. It needs to have a regional setting. It needs to have a regional engagement. And unfortunately, I think we're, we're just in our infancy of developing those models of coming up with something that is predictable and, and sustainable in, in terms of uh, collaboration. So le let me just end on the point to say that with all the, the, the proud history of refugee protection in this continent, with all the efforts that are going on, the status quo is not one we can live with. So mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to find, um, together with the US, together with countries in the region, together with other stakeholders, uh, importantly, uh, civil society, development agencies, private sector, we need to find a much better um, framing for that collaborative effort. Thank you, John. And actually building on that, there is a vital element of the recently unveiled US strategy to enhance the management of arrivals, which is the establishment of the safe mobility offices in countries like Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, initially with plans for expansion in other countries as well. The SMOs are, uh, among other things, envisioned to play a crucial role in enabling individuals within the region to be considered for humanitarian protection, employment, or family reunification pathways to the United States, Canada, and, and Spain without the need for spontaneous travel to the U.S. border, which is a little bit about the reaching to people before. And I think IOM and UNHCR are in integral to, to the establishment of these SMOs. Could you discuss your organization's experiences in this regard and the potential of such initiatives as policy response, both in our hemisphere and beyond? You want to get started? <laughs> okay, so let me pick this one up first, uh, also because it builds on my last point. Um, the status quo is not okay. It, the status quo is one that does not deliver protection and solutions to people who are in dire need, people who are on the move, and who, as a result of our in inability to deliver, deliver that protection and those solutions, as a result of that, we have in a way outsourced the delivery of protection and solutions to smugglers, to traffickers, who are filling the gap, who are stepping in and saying, I will provide you a solution. I can sell you a way to find uh, to find protection, and we need to we need to break that. We need to find a way to put uh, to put that exploitative system out of business. Um, where does this fit with the SMOs, safe mobility offices? It's subject of a lot of attention at the moment, as it should be. Um, I think, from our perspective, um, UN, uh, UNHCR, IOM. Um, Bansa would speak to it, of course, as well. Um, we are seeing this as a way to move a step forward towards trying to break that status quo. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it by looking at, here is a collaborative effort. The US is reaching out to certain states. It's talking about how can we engage with people in those settings in order to, uh, to offer 
at least for certain people, a shortcut to cut out the smuggler, a shortcut to cut out the Darien, to cut out uh, dangerous uh, movement through, through Mexico in order to, to, to find that uh, uh, solution at an earlier stage. It's a very complex undertaking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's complex legally speaking. It's complex operationally speaking. It's complex politically speaking. Um, but looking back six months when we first had our conceptual discussions on this, I think <laughs> it's, 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 it can be also labeled a, 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 an achievement that we are now in an operational reality where this is being tested. It's being piloted. We have offices on the ground in three in three um, countries, and I'm saying we, meaning the United States, UNHCR, IOM, and host country engagement, having a, a, a collaborative framework to coordinate how we engage with, with certain populations. Um, I think it's still very much a forward-looking effort. It's a pilot that we're seeing, how, how is this working? How do we identify people? How do we process and screen them? How do we refer them to the, the US government? Uh, and how do we make this happen quickly? Because that's a key. Uh, we, need to, we need to break the idea that refugee resettlement and pathways takes years, months. We need to, we need to make it uh, happen in weeks. So, so in that sense, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting prospect for us. Um, it still has a long way to go. It's certainly not delivering now on, on all of this in terms of how do you how do you reach the right people to mm -hmm. do this? Um, how do you do that um, in a way that pro provides predictable outcomes for the people who go through it, uh, the, pr the process? And here is an important point. How does it infect, how does it affect the, um, the setting where it's operating? Um, these are countries that also have asylum systems. These are countries that have um, uh, efforts to integrate and include displaced populations. We don't want to disturb that. We want to build on that. Mm -hmm. We want that to also be part of a comprehensive solution because we do know this, that the, the, the SMOs will not provide solutions for the majority of the people in this situation. So it's essential that we don't get too blinkered here and look at what is this mechanism and how do we build it? Let's open that discussion and see what other elements needs to be in place for this to be an overall success. So uh, a lot of elements in this that we can we can come back to, but I'll turn it to Lance Arthur. Thanks. I mean, I fully uh, <clears throat> subscribe to everything Jan has, has mentioned. I think it's really important to understand, irrespective of sort of the, some of the fairly grand announcements that were made around um, the Safe Mobility Initiative. Uh, it's it's one tiny piece of a much more complex, larger uh, puzzle of uh, both opportunities and challenges when it comes to uh, people on the move. Um, and so as, as Jan mentioned, we're very much in the pilot phase. And so it's very difficult to be definitive about the effectiveness of the system and, uh, and you know, at this stage uh, and, and whether more should have been done, whether a different conceptualization should have been introduced. Uh, we're learning very valuable lessons, I think, in partnership with, um, with all concerns. I think the important element, of course, is that this has enabled a much more robust dialogue uh, between host countries uh the united states and other potential destination countries um and there's this tremendous value in having uh generic i think really elicited a lot of interest on the part of other governments as well there are many uh, stakeholders who are watching very carefully um how this initiative plays out and whether that might represent a new model um, to pilot elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, uh, Europeans and Sub-Saharan Africa were discussing the uh, first lessons learned from the SMO model uh, very recently. I think it's very interesting for us to see that there is, you know, um, a bit of a, a renewed interest, let's say, uh, in thinking out of the box and coming up with solutions. Whether the targeting is ideal, whether you know the initiative to be more effective should be replicated elsewhere, whether the pathways that are being made available to applicants uh, should be more diverse and more suited to their needs. I think these are all valid and open questions. Um, and we, we're clearly you know, struggling with operationalizing all of this because it's easier said than done. You can talk about nice concepts in Washington, D.C. It's something else to implement them. I can tell you in Guatemala and Colombia and in Costa Rica and potentially elsewhere in Latin America. Um, but there is, there is continued interest and support for the initiative six months into its uh, initiation, which is uh, 
which is important. Uh, so the political dynamic is there. And I think we are identifying meaningful solutions, unfortunately, as Jan said, for a tiny sliver uh, of, uh, of the population of concern uh, to both of our organizations, but at least we're starting somewhere. Um, and so I think we, we, we remain quite positive and optimistic as to the validity of the concept, let's say, as we move forward. Thank you, Vincent. And maybe just a final question, one to Vincent and one for, for John. Vincent, uh, one of the challenges in this process lies in the necessity to continually evolve and expand access to labor-based and sponsorship pathways to the United States mm -hmm. and other major destination countries as well. Could you highlight some of the challenges associated with this expansion? And then for John, how is humanitarian protection evolving on a global scale? How might the ongoing efforts in the Western Hemisphere to adapt protection systems contribute to improvements in similar endeavors elsewhere in the world? And what lessons can we draw from innovations occurring also in other regions as well? Uh, so on other forms of, uh, of pathways, this speaks a little bit to the lessons we're learning from the implementation of the Safe Mobility Initiative. Um, short as it may be as far as our real life experiencing piloting this but you know obviously the sponsorship mechanism is very interesting because i think it's um it's an it's an initiative certainly in the united states that has generated generated a lot of enthusiasm um to adopt new modalities to try and bring in uh family members or community members into the us in a, in a regular manner um what we see, however, on the ground is a certain mismatch, let's say, um, between those who may avail themselves of these modalities and those who are more at risk of seeking irregular migration and putting their life in danger uh, as they do so. And so in a sense, the general assumption, which I think has been validated by our own experience, is that if you have a passport, which is a requirement of these, of these mechanisms, whether towards the US or other uh, destination countries, if you have family or strong connections already in a regular situation or as U.S. citizens in the United States, you are more likely uh, to be relatively better off mm -hmm. um, than the more destitute uh, portion of a country's population that would be seeking to put their and their families' lives in harm's way, crossing the Darien on foot and so on. And so there is a bit of, bit of, and of course, you know, a lot of these um, initiatives are also being drawn up in response to a perception that we have a crisis situation on our hands on the southwest border across the Darien Gap. And we see the Darien Gap numbers continue to increase irrespective of some of these mechanisms and initiatives. And so I think there is a clear <laughs> lesson to be learned or there's, there's room, let's say, for further adjustments um, when it comes to these specific requirements if we are indeed to continue prioritizing the introduction of mechanisms that specifically targets irregular migration, um, that put people's uh, protection in danger. Um, and the documentation, private sponsorship requirement really is, uh, um, I think, a, um, a series of significant obstacles to most. There are many initiatives that are being thought through in the US in particular to try and overcome the sponsorship requirement in particular, um, which we're seeking to both uh, support. Uh, and I know the administration also supports um, the initiation of such innovative approaches to identify perhaps other forms of support um, that could generate uh, sponsorship opportunities. Uh, very briefly, labor pathways, circular labor migration, very important points. Um, what we've seen as well, especially in Guatemala, for example, is that the majority of those who apply um, through the Safe Mobility Initiative, um, outside of the protection framework, of course, are actually more interested in labor mobility uh, schemes than they are in permanent uh, settlements uh, in the United States. Um, and so identifying ways in which we may be able to increase the volume the pace um, of those who may be able to avail of these types of opportunities, I think would be very helpful to try and tap into um, the pool of migrants, including the potential eligibility of transit migrants for some of these, uh, these schemes. I mean, you know, the United States in particular has visa schemes um, that are available for agricultural work, non-agricultural work, but those are primarily directed at the domestic population of given countries, mm -hmm. not transit migrants. Um, and so I think potentially the inclusion of transit migrants as eligible um, caseloads for these types of schemes would also go some ways towards um, you know, increasing the, the universe of, of pathways that are being made available, available to, um, to the populations on the move. Thanks, Vincent. John. <laughs> 
Um, yes, you, you you asked about the global um, perspective on humanity on, on on protection and and the response, and it, it made me think of I've been twenty five years with UNHCR, and it's it's a bit depressing that I think every of the one of those years we have given updates where we use the word unprecedented or record numbers or it's never been worse. So it it sort of it it can be a depressing perspective that it seems that every year we talk about how how bad things are and, and it's true the numbers are unprecedented uh, populations on the move have never been uh, or displaced have never been greater than now and and to me it points to a few things um, uh, and don't worry I'll come back to some more optimistic points um, um, first of all root causes we're not able to address the root causes of displacement in an effective way to, to turn that trend around. Um, and I certainly uh, don't have uh, the answers to, to doing that, uh, but obviously we're talking about a much bigger issue than the humanitarian response. We're talking about global politics. And, and, and as I think our High Commissioner said to the Security Council once, has, has the world become unable to broker peace, uh, because uh, emergencies, displacement is, is increasing in, in, in frequency and size. I think at the moment, UNHCR has defined around 20 of our global operations as, as emergencies. And, and on average, every second week, there is a new one. So, so um, yeah, quite a, a, a sobering and bleak um, global perspective in terms of the outlook for, for, for continued displacement. Um, Maybe also staying on the on the negative track, uh, reflecting on my own twenty five years of of uh, and the development when it comes specifically to the mixed movement is a couple of mega trends of because of the inability of states to often come up with what they consider a, a, an effective response. It's tempting to turn to the more straightforward ones, which is restrictions on movements. Mm -hmm. And and um, you know limiting access, and I think it's a trend we've seen through the last couple of decades that this um, restriction on 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 people on the move, and even in some cases criminalization of people on the move, has has very much affected the way that that responses are shaped around the world. And adding to that is, of course, the politics of this. The, politicization and the polarization of the mixed movement issue in national settings has very much shaped how we are able to operate in many situations, how governments are able to operate. And it has shown to be a tempting prospect for a lot of politicians to make use of this for short-term short, short -term political gain. So it's create, it has created over the last couple of, of decades uh, a bit of a stalemate in many settings where the politics takes over the ability of, of, of a collective response. But let me not uh, end on that very negative note. I think there's a lot happening globally that uh, shows some promise. And, and starting with the big picture, um, the two of us are sitting up here now, but there is, of course, also uh, parallel global um, efforts to rally support around refugee response and migration response, the global compact on refugees, the global compact on migration um, are, are sort of tag teaming every second year to keep the, the, the world community focused on this issue. How do we not only preserve the normative framework and develop the normative framework, but how do we create responses that can can deliver on that promise? And and we see we see potential in that. We see we see progress in that. Um, another buzzword, maybe, but an important one: innovation, technology. Um, it's so important and, and and so fast moving. And and you know the classic example of I think we were all taken aback 10, 15 years ago that charging points was the first thing you needed to put up in an emergency response. It, 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 it was sort of a revelation, I think, to the whole humanitarian community that we, di we didn't have that as a priority for a while. Now we do know this priority, but it is much more than just connectivity. It is access to services through technology. It is empowerment through technology, and it has many different sides to it. And we're seeing interesting um, developments, of course, around how to make use of that technology. And by the way, the SMOs are using technology in the way that people, for instance, are self-enrolling 
to be considered for the SMOs. So not lining up at the IOM or UNHCR office, but self-enrolling to be identified. So that has its own challenges, but it's an exciting prospect. Um, so maybe ending then on, on again on a bigger uh, picture issue, but again, one we are positive about, um, then that is the, develop, the relief to development gap, the, the, the nexus between global development efforts and the, the response to, to, to mixed movements. We, we've seen a lot of positive engagement in the recent years where those worlds are not yet quite there in looking at it in the same way, but are coming together in a way, at least that in, in my years with UNHCR has, has changed quite fundamentally. Look at the World Bank most recent uh, global report. It has the theme of migration and, and refugee movements. That's something that I think if it happened 20 years ago, we would, have been, uh, we, we, we would not have foreseen it. Um, so, and, and that has a lot of elements to it as well. How do we come together as, as UN system actors, but also as, as uh, with, with, with other stakeholders in, in building on, on, on all the, 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 the global resources that are there and, and the goodwill that is there. Um, so, so I wanted to end on, on, on a positive note. Thanks so much. Uh, let's have a little bit of a quick round of questions uh, since we have a both virtual on in-person audience. Let me start perhaps as you queue up uh, the line, maybe just to respond a few couple of questions uh, considering timing. Uh, but let me start with a, one question that was raised uh, online. Uh, spending per person on Afghan and Syrians and Ukraine is higher than Venezuelans. Can you explain why we pay more attention to European Middle Eastern African refugees crisis but not those closer to the U.S. geographically. I, I was saying before this, I think the tough part will be the questions. Um, no, um, I think it's a fair question. You know, how, how does one make sure that uh, the response to people in need of protection is not guided by proximity or, you know, origin or, or any kind of... Uh, any kind of, of dis, dis, uh, distinctions that a certain population has, it needs to be, it needs to be based on a normative framework. It needs to be based on a rights and obligation um, engagement when it comes to the core of refugee protection. Um, and and this is why I mentioned a few times in, in my interventions the, the the how important it is that the normative framework for us very much built around the asylum. Um, systems around the world, but based, of course, on the on the 1951 Refugee Convention, how important it is that as we innovate and as we elaborate new ways of doing things, that we don't lose the core of that normative framework, because that core normative framework is blind or should be blind to who has the right. It should. It, it depends on 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 uh, your protection need. It doesn't depend on who you are, and it's a hard fort normative framework. It is not a given that if we started it over today, that it would look the same. It is a 70 year period of developing the, 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 the implementation of the Refugee Convention. And I think it's a, it's a key part of the answer to that question. Now, um, I also think we shouldn't, um, we, should, we shouldn't be too surprised that countries around the world would have higher priority to certain elements of a situation and lower priority to another. And I think there, the, 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 the discretionary element there is, is something we have to live with. And I think something that we have to accept to some extent, certainly when it comes to response that goes beyond the core refugee rights. Um, I think I don't have the answer to as to one particular group versus another. I think it's a good thing that the U.S. has provided solutions for Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing that the U.S. has offered uh, Afghans to come to this country. Um, I think it's a it's a uh, you know where where we need to to keep our eyes open is to see does this come at the cost of people who have a right to find protection in this country. If it does, then we need to we need to address that and we need to make sure that that it, it, it's not one or the other. It is, um, it is the core that needs to be in place. And then there is a discretionary element that I think we have to accept that states will pursue partially also on what they are seeing in, 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 in their 
in 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 their neighboring um, uh, areas. So um, yeah, I'm I don't I'm afraid I don't have a sort of clearer answer than that off the top of my head. No, I mean you know thanks, Jan, for uh, taking this one. But uh, uh, I think we should also continue to bear in mind that you know in terms of resources. Those who are hosting refugees, uh, you know, bear a much larger share of the uh, of the resources that are required to cater for, you know, the long term integration and protection of those who need it. Uh, you know, and certainly in the in the Venezuela situation, we've seen, as we mentioned at the outset, that uh, countries such as Colombia, Peru, Ecuador have invested considerable resources. Um, you know, in Colombia hosts close to 3 million Venezuelans, right? Um, which is far more than uh, than any other country in response to the crisis that had generated, I think, almost 7 uh, million Venezuelans being displaced and crossing their country's borders. And so at the end of the day, I think it's a, it's a it continues to be uh, very important for the US um, to be an example to the rest of the world in terms of, you know, its solar solidarity, it's, it's continued. There are very few countries in the world that provides almost systematic uh, humanitarian assistance, regardless of where a crisis um, originates. And all of those that, have, that were mentioned are uh, crisis settings um, that the US, uh, for, for which solutions are supported by the United States. Um, but those who host refugees and migrants, I think those are the ones that need to be supported first and foremost. And as, it's, as it is uh, in South America, certainly those governments have done a lot. So that perhaps goes towards explaining as well why on a per capita basis, the requirements were also a bit lesser uh, when it comes to Venezuela vis-a-vis -vis other uh, situations. All right. Why don't we go ahead and we um, we ask both? I mean, I see two people lined up at the queue uh, on both sides of the of the room. So if you could maybe ask your question and your question, and we can wrap up the, the session that way uh, with the responses, of course, from John and Vincent. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much for your insight. Um, I'm Rachel Levitan. I work with Hyas. We work globally, but we are also in 11 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean and serve around 750,000 people in the region per year. Um, I'm, I'm wondering with the climate change very much on the agenda of the Secretary General, uh, I wonder how well each of your agencies have integrated climate-related displacement, both into your strategies and into your programs in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hannah Flam. I work at the International Refugee Assistance Project, and I have two questions about the SMOs, or SMOs, as I hear they are sometimes called. Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got back from Guatemala and visited uh, one of the SMOs in this trip, um, and there were only Venezuelans. At that location, Venezuelans are categorically ineligible for any of the lawful pathways that um, the SMOs in Guatemala offer. I realize this is a pilot stage, but my first question is, what opportunities do your agencies see in expanding access for the people um, who are eligible for those pathways and also the opportunity to expand the pathways that the offices offer? Um, secondly, um, you spoke to the innovation of allowing people seeking protection to apply on their own without any intermediary. Um, and my question is what efforts um, will IOM and UNHCR undertake to ensure that there is more equitable access on those web platforms and otherwise, because I think in the absence of some um, overture and accessibility uh, for people who are fleeing persecution, they will face the biggest obstacles um, if it's just an open platform to anyone. Thank you. All right, let's just give like five minutes stops because we are really running super late on time, but please go ahead. <laughs> uh, and these are very straightforward questions, yeah, right? Yeah, so that's uh, easy. It should be very easy for you. <laughs> um, please don't call them smoes. It really makes my skin, my skin is curl. Uh, you're not the only one, but you know, the SMOs, um, I mean, all of what you said makes a lot of sense. Um, certainly, uh, we're hopeful that as as we continue implementing um, uh, this initiative, we'll be able to expand the scope of those nationalities that may be eligible um, in certain countries. So, as you know, uh, since you were in Guatemala, uh, you know. Uh, 
depending on the, the the nature of the of the operational uh, and political agreement that's in place to to operate uh, in the in the host countries different nationalities are being targeted um and so that is a result of of ongoing robust um, and healthy conversations uh, amongst concerned governments. And so I think it's important to iterate that, you know, neither UNHCR nor IOM mm -hmm. are necessarily setting um, the parameters, but we very much hope that, um, you know, the principle is that those who are in need of these solutions should be uh, eligible uh, to these uh, to these schemes. So we're very much hoping that we'll work towards that, including in allowing, uh, you know, uh, more uh, user-friendly uh, ways to apply uh, and, um, and more human interface as well, which does not, um, is, is not completely evacuated from the scheme. Um, Climate-related uh, strategies and displacements, I think, you know, um, we try and uh, take into consideration these factors, particularly in, uh, across some sub-regions that are very vulnerable uh, to climate change, the Caribbean being sort of the center of our attention. We're very hopeful that the LA declaration process um, uh, will soon include climate-related uh, elements into its focus as well. Um, to what extent that uh, enters um, the perspective when it comes to um, to legal pathways, I think that's an open question. Um, and that is a global conversation, which is politically loaded as well to an extent, but certainly in the Western Hemisphere, we see a need um, to be more cognizant of these dimensions, which do push people uh, to cross borders, whether voluntarily or not. Um, these are not very good answers, I'm, I'm afraid, but that's, the, <laughs> that's all I can come up with in the time. Mm -hmm. And let me try to just add a couple of points to it. Um, yeah, I fully agree with what Mansa says. On the SMOs, um, I think absolutely one of the, 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 the successes of looking ahead, no, one of the, the looking ahead, what would make it a success is the expansion of which populations it could reach. And I think the eligibility there uh, in, in each of the locations where it's operational will be be key. It's something that primarily would have to be worked out between the states. Um, it's not something that UNCRI can come in and, and just say, this is how it's going to be. So it, it needs to be a, a, a collaborative discussion, but we are fully in agreement that that is a, a key point moving it forward. The, the, when it comes to the, the tool of, of using technology to bring people, give people access to services and to, to processes, I think there is very much opportunities there and there are risks and you're pointing towards some of the risks. What about people who are not, uh, who are not really able to access uh, digital tools or who are not familiar with it? It might be a threshold for them. So um, that's, that's something we're very aware of and that's, that's why the, the onboarding through digital tools should not be the only way to access something. It should be an additional, it should be something that broadens the access. It shouldn't be something that limits the access. And, and there are many ways that that can be done either by allowing for a certain interface direct or also by uh, following up uh, people who have approached the, the, the website uh, in, in different ways. Um, Maybe on the on the on the the climate change on UNHCR, we do actually have a strategic framework for climate action. I even brought it with me um, because I I'm no expert on it, but just to say that it is obviously a very um, very topical issue for us. Um, and and it, as it's uh, UN General Assembly week, the, the this is one of the topics that's very much uh, present in in discussions. And for us, of course, the entry point is. It creates displacement. Climate change creates displacement and puts people on the move. And secondly, people who are displaced um, are affected by climate change and can affect climate change unless they're given opportunity not to affect it. So look at Bangladesh with its uh, the world's biggest refugee camp. If people cannot find other ways to, to uh, find energy for cooking, uh, then they will go to the, the local forest and, and, and again contribute to a potential um, climate, uh, uh, negative climate um, impact. So, so this is for us a, a, a very, a very um, topical issue for, in very short terms. For us, it's a law and policy engagement with states. It's an operational issue in our own operations. And thirdly, importantly, it's a footprint thing. What about the UN's footprint? What about how the UN operates? How about we travel? How we 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 buy, um, uh, and and how we procure and how we do logistics? So so all of these are elements are relevant to our strategy. Final point on on this, 
UNHCR is not a fan of the term climate refugees. And that is a, a, a maybe a discussion for, 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 for another time. But it, it has something to do with what I mentioned earlier. The normative framework for refugees has been hard fought through the... Um, through the, the years after the Refugee Convention was developed, through the regional efforts we've, we've been talking about. And UNHCR is weary of the refugee concept being put in boxes that are where states have discretion, mm -hmm. where it is um, an aspirational effort, because it could muddle the waters for us on what are the rights and obligations of states when it comes to refugees. And we don't want to open that discussion too wide, and 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 one of the elements there um, it could be the, the 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 those who say let's put the refugee convention aside, let's make a new one, and let's include, for instance, climate. We see a lot of risk in that approach, but it's obviously possible to argue in both directions. Thank you. Just want to remind uh, the audience that we're gonna. Uh, still remain remain seated for the next session. And with that, thank you so much, uh, John and Sam.